This is the Wairere Tamiti audiences are used to seeing. And most recently when he was arrested as part of the 2007 anti-terrorism raids in Te Uruera. But a new film titled The Price of Peace goes beyond the surface into the world of Tame and takes a different approach to telling the story of the raids. Award-winning director and co-producer Kim Webby says she wanted to show all sides of Tame. Yes, I think because everybody knows Tame as the activist, um, <clears throat> but I knew him differently, you know, I knew him as a grandfather and as a father, um, as a Murai committee chairman, you know, a leader in his community, <clears throat> and his backstory, you know, of the way he was raised and um, the things that sparked and inspired his activism. And I wanted the public to know all of Tamir, you know, he's a, such a multifaceted character, um, that, and they just had a one-dimensional picture. I was really... Um, Pleased to have Tami as a central character because he is such a character. Um, for me, it's probably the first film that I've made that doesn't have narration, where I haven't written a script and voiceover. Um, and it was quite hard for me to let go of that and just let the story tell itself rather than me tell the story. The film also addresses how the rain specifically affected the Tuhoi community. I wanted people to see how much the actions of the police on that day had affected people within Rautoki. And I hoped that the film would go some way towards healing um, that pain and that hurt. I never set out to kind of change the world or change people's point of view, um, but, you know, if it gives some people a more intimate, deeper understanding of Te Ao Māori and Te Ao Tūhoi and also of Tame and what drives and motivates him and the sort of person that he is um, other than just the media images of a man shooting the flag or you know protesting outside parliament or something um, then I think that it will have achieved something. <laughs> After seeing the reports of the raids Kim made the film October 15 which followed the personal stories of families in the Ruatuki area. She then decided to carry on filming to tell the rest of the story from the perspective of the Tuhoi community. When I began, um, I began by going to see Tamati and saying, I, would, I want to make this film um, and would this be something that you would support? And he said to me, what perspective will it come from? He said, I think he said that they would like it to be from a Tuhoi perspective. And the journalist in me sort of went, oh, I can't take a side. And then the human being in me understood that I had been so involved with that community for so many years that I didn't have any other perspective anyway. So it's unashamedly and upfrontedly <laughs> told from a Tuhoi perspective. Since the premiere, one review felt the film didn't explain the reasons behind the training camp, which Kim says is a valid point. In interviewing Tamir, I think I interviewed him six times. Um, he was interviewed in two different languages and asked that question over and over again, why were you doing that, why were you doing that? And he never really varied from his answer very much. So I think there's three times in the film where he describes why they were doing what they were doing. As a filmmaker, it didn't go as far as I wanted. Um, I couldn't find another way to ask that question and get a different answer. I think as there was no different answer. Um, I guess for me that was that's always been a bit of a slight frustration with the film. The documentary also addresses the media's role in the portrayal of Tame and the Tuhoi people. It's always going to go for the most sensational, the you know, the most dramatic and that's how Tame I think has become you know, branded as this activist and this sort of slightly wild man. Um, and it does take a lot longer to get underneath that and find a different layer and a different level and a deeper understanding. Webby says it's not about criticising individual journalists, but more acknowledging the changes in the media industry. I mean, these days everything's broken down into news bites and there's not an opportunity in news and often also in current affairs to really get very far beyond that. News, current affairs are always going to pick up the most polarising aspect um, and that is never going to really build understanding um, or draw cultures closer together.
One of three producers on the film, Christina Milligan, says the commercialisation of our media industry is a major issue. Our media is probably, as our mainstream media is getting whiter and whiter and whiter by the day. And it's almost like because we have Māori television, we can now put all the Māori uh, stories, etc., uh, Indigenous stories, over in that box and it's taken care of. And the government's took that one off because they fund Māori television and we don't need to worry about the wider public discourse. And I think that is... Uh, I mean, it's not just in terms of Indigenous politics, but it's a really, really, really big, big issue in this country, the lack of wide public discourse because, principally because of the commercialisation of our mainstream media. But she says the film helps to push the importance of Indigenous storytelling. Well, I'm old enough to go back to a time when there was very little Indigenous voice except as the exotic um, in even the New Zealand, the early New Zealand drama that I worked on, I worked in the early days with people like Rawiri Paratini and uh, Pat Hoiper, in fact, on a drama that we made at South Pacific Pictures in the 80s, I guess it would have been. And getting past that and uh, uh, has taken quite a long time. I'm a real optimist uh, in the film world here bec- simply because if audiences are going to see Māori stories, which they are with films like Mount Zion with the Dark Horse uh, and the Patriarch Lee Tamahori's new film is coming up, if they're going to see those films, then those films will continue to be made. On a wider scope, the film points towards the importance of reconciliation and the state of race relations in the country. I, I love the way Russell Fairbrother... Um, Tame's defence lawyer talked about two worlds and two cultures that don't talk easily with each other. I think there is a really key message in this film which is one of the reasons why I'd certainly like it to be seen more widely, particularly, for instance, in the United States, uh, maybe in South Africa, obviously up in the Pacific. It would surprise a lot of people who are very disheartened about their own um, relations between uh, the ethnicities in their country to see that it is possible to apologise and forgive. Ultimately, Kim hopes the film will keep Māori dim alive and bring understanding of the culture to all audiences. I think it validates um, specifically Tuhoi culture because it's a specifically Tuhoi film um, and I hope that it will make Māori... Um, proud to be a part of that um, and also spur on people to keep striving for that um, biculturalism and um, to really keep everything about being Māori alive so that it's not just at Kapahaka or it's not just on the occasions that you know uh, Māori go to marae for tangi and things like that you know but that it's actually really part of everyday life, part of the fabric of being. It's a really significant time in history and New Zealanders um, are possibly not as aware of specifically the magnitude and the importance of the Tuhoi Crown settlement. I think <clears throat> I think for me that's even more important um, than the raids because that's a blueprint for the future of New Zealand and the fact that the Crown conceded te mana motuhaki or tūhoi or tūhoi sovereignty. That's never happened ever, ever in New Zealand. Um, I think it's so, it's dramatic, you know, and it really is um, showing the way to the future. The film screens once more at the New Zealand International Film Festival today, then tours around the country before airing on Māori television October 13. Alistair Kata for Pacific Media Watch.